can I draw you a picture? I think that's my only hope of having your attention when you have bacon in front of you. I want to draw you a picture. I think there's four kinds of humans. I think there's four kinds of humans. There's the person I call the no-step human. The no-step human lives life like this. They're in a box of isolation. This is the no-step human. This is no one here because you're here. If you were this person, you would not be here. This person lives in a box of isolation. Now, what types of humans need help? All humans, like all humans need help. The person who lives in a box of isolation never, get, never gets help on anything in life because they've kind of given up on it. They've just like, they, they just like, this is my life, this is the way it is. They are so isolated as a person that they see no, they see no hope for change. They don't even think about it. Once again, that's not you. Then we have the one-step human. This person also needs help. This person takes one step. They, they consider where could help come from, but this person lives in a hole of desperation. Box of isolation, a hole of desperation. They look for help, but all they see in front of their face is what? Dirt. They see no possibilities. There's help, but help can't help me. Look at my life. So because they've gotten themselves to a place of desperation, the desperation is they don't think help can help them. Help is for other people. And then we have the two-step human. The two-step human, and this is where I think many people live, is the two-step human. This is the person, step one is they look for help. Step two is they look for the help to change them. They look for help, but then they think the help is going to change them. This person is, they read the book. Oh, the, I, I need to read that book. And then they read it and they wonder if the book changed them or not. So then you go to the next book. Oh, and then you listen to that podcast. And we do all these help things, but nothing changes. So this person lives in a circle of frustration because I tried this thing and I tried that thing. And then I tried that thing and nothing changed. And it becomes this circle of frustration. I'm, I'm trying everything and nothing's changing. Ah, but then there's the two-step human, the three-step human. The three-step human is the person that does step one they go to a source of help, but then they do step two, which is they act on the help, which causes the power or results of the help. What I wanna show you today in scripture is what this step two looks like. Many people live right here in this space in life, over here, the two-step person. This is where most people live. You see, the three-step human, they go, to a, they go to a source of help and they get a principle. But then they do something to practice the principle, which causes the power of the principle to happen in their life. This is the person that's like, well, I prayed, is God going to do something? There are many things in life where we call out to God to do something in the spiritual that, he's caused, that he calls us to walk out in the natural, to experience the spiritual. Jesus said, you, you go to church to bring your gift to the altar and you realize, you know what, I have a problem with a brother. Jesus said, it's not the time for the giving of the gift. First go and deal with your brother, then come and give your gift. Many people want to come to church and say, Jesus, help my marriage. Amen. He's like, why don't you deal with it? 
You see, you can't ask God to do something in the spiritual that he's called you to do in the natural with your own voice and with your own hands. Mm. Are we helping anybody? What kind of human are you? In your, in your job, actually, let me give you a minute to talk at your tables for just a second. I want you to talk about an area of your life where you are a three-step human in an area of your life where you are a two-step human. So what are the areas of our life? Occupation, um, hobbies, family, our, our marriage, our kids. Think of the different categories of your life. Are you a three-step human? In what area? You're a two-step human in what area? Or is there an area where you're a one-step human? where you've given up. Your personal health is a category of your life. So let's take about two minutes and talk about that with the guys at your table. Okay, so 2 Kings chapter five. Let's look at 2 Kings chapter five and we're gonna look at the story of a man that was a two-step human that became a three-step human and experienced the power of God. So 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, verse 1, now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. He was a mighty man of valor, but a leper. If Naaman is like you and I, and he is like you and I, because humans are humans, right? We're just, we're just not very different. We're just not very different. Humans are humans. The guy next to you is a lot like you. And you're a lot like the guy next to you. And you're just like me. And I'm just like you. What do you think Naaman thought when he woke up every day? Do you think he thought, you know what? I am a mighty man of valor. I love this. What do you think he thought when he woke up? I'm a leper. What do you think the last thought was before he went to bed at night, before he fell asleep? I'm a leper. When will I stop being a leper? I can't tell you the number of men I talk to that there's one thing that I say to them that causes instant tears to come down their face might be the first time I meet with them and I hear five minutes of their story and I say, can I tell you something? You're a heck of a man. Because many people wake up every day and they say, I'm a leper. There's something in their life that has become the identity of their life. I don't know anyone that judges their lives more harshly than Christians. That we evaluate and measure our life by the depth of our sin, not the depth of God's grace. And it feels right, it almost feels moral. I should be hard on myself. It almost feels godly. It almost feels godly, like I am so mad at myself for having this problem. It almost feels like you're being righteous. Yes, you should be, you should be down on yourself. If, if you were to say to a friend, I had this problem, I hate it. You, 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 the response sometimes is, yeah, you really should hate that. We, we so identify ourselves by our problem. And we so struggle to identify ourselves that we have been made alive with Christ. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Not after we fixed a problem, before we fixed our problem. I, I promise you this room is full of mighty men of valor. But I wonder how many of you today are going to measure your life by the depth of your sin instead of the depth of God's grace. 
I know a lot of men who walk around just living in shame because of a problem they have, and they totally forget everything great about them as a man, all the good works of God in them. The number of people who live their life with this, this, this shroud, this, this guilt, this frustration, the number of men I know who, who live their life with this feeling that I'm nothing but a failure, and the truth is they've been nothing but faithful. And the difference between thinking you've been a failure and, and being a person who realizes you've been faithful is just a matter of perspective. Every day as a man, when you go to the closet and you open the closet door, there's two things in every man's closet. There is the hanger, and from it hangs a cape, which represents the calling and purpose of your life. But also in your closet is this small little box in the corner on the floor that represents the kryptonite of your life. And what many men do is we look at that kryptonite and say, you know what? I don't get to wear the cape today because that still exists. You know how hard it is to live as a man when you have no cape around your neck? When you don't put the cape around your neck, it is almost impossible to have power over kryptonite. I used to have uh, about a 30-year affair with little W oatmeal cream pies. <laughs> and... If I woke up every day saying, I must lose weight, that's not inspiring. I must not overeat today. And that became the measure of my life, was what I did with food. And then at the end of the day every day, the measure of my day was, did I overeat? That is not looking at my life through the eyes of who I am in Christ. That's looking at my life and measuring it by who I am in my sin. It feels right. It feels righteous that I should think about my sin problem. I must deal with my sin problem today. You see, what a man does every day when he goes to the closet is he's honest about kryptonite, he realizes what kryptonite can do to him. He's honest about it. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't avoid it. He doesn't say it doesn't matter. But he puts his cape on every day. And he, he walks with his shoulders square and his chin up. What many people do is, after I fix my problem, I'll wear my cape. You will never wear a cape if you think that way. Never. What strong men do is they wake up and they put on their cape of calling. They put on the, this is who I am in Christ. While they face their problem boldly. Life is not fix my problem, then live my best bold life. No, life is you live your best bold life in Christ while you boldly face your problem. Come on, somebody. Let's talk about Naaman. <laughs> but let me just say, when's the last time someone looked at you and said, you're a great man? And if your wife isn't doing that, I'm sorry. She probably should be. Hopefully the men in your life are telling you that. Hopefully you've got men in your life that when they hold you accountable... They don't talk about your kryptonite, they talk about your cape. Come on, somebody. Sometimes accountability is all about, well, it's someone when they call me, they check in on how I'm doing with my sin. I want friends that call me and hold me accountable and check me in, check in on me on how I'm doing with my purpose. Because you know what happens when I'm living out my purpose? I'm staying away from kryptonite. I used to hate vulnerability because, and here's why, I used to hate the thought that if I admitted to someone a problem I had, that they would then look at me through that same lens. 
I hated looking at my life, and I looked at my life every day. Pretty much every moment, I looked at it according to what my body looked like. I'm overweight. I got to lose weight. That's what I thought. That was the constant theme. If I shook your hand, I was thinking, what does he think about how I look? I promise. If I walked into a room, what did he think about how I look? So my problem, and you fill in the blank with your problem, my problem was the constant theme of my mind. The last thing I wanted was to admit to a person a problem I had. It, it felt awful to me to think that now my friend is going to think about me the way I think about me. And that sounds awful. This is why you need friends in your life that look at you and they talk about your cape, not your kryptonite. Mm. Let's go on the story. Verse 2, and the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought, had brought back cap, captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, thus and thus said the girl who was from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see now, see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king saying, why have, to, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Now, if you're one of the servants and you're with Naaman, you're with this man, and everyone is thinking, right? Everyone's thinking his big problem, leprosy. This is the moment. Your whole trip there, you're wondering, is it going to change? Are any of you, you ever been on a long trip with someone, metaphorically speaking, where you're hoping that their life finally changes? The longer the trip goes, the more we focus on what we think their problem is. I was talking to a man two nights ago. He has a good friend in, in, in this situation. And I talk about weight because it, it's relevant to my life. But there's a hundred ways of being overweight, actually a thousand. But in this case, he said, I have this childhood friend who weighs over 400 pounds. And he said, I'm... I'm I want to see if I can buy a, an exercise, a piece of exercise equipment for his garage. The longer we live with someone in a problem, we think their problem is their problem, and their problem is not the problem. And we all hold our breath, hoping if he just loses weight, if they just change, if they just stop drinking, if they just stop. But the problem is never the problem. And the longer we, the harder we focus on the problem, we stifle our ability to help people actually get to what is really the cause of the problem. You imagine having a son that's addicted to gaming. You walk in the room, you need to stop gaming. You're wasting your life. And the 16 year old is thinking they don't, know how to form these words yet, 
But the reality is the 16-year-old is thinking, you know what, I think my life is a waste. I think there's no point of my existence on planet Earth. I think no one likes me. I think I'm an idiot and I'm ugly. I'll never get married and I can't stop watching pornography. But when I'm gaming, that's the only time I feel like I'm alive. So why would I stop gaming? When it's the only time in my life where I just feel like I'm okay to be. And we think we need to change the gaming. No, what needs to happen is what causes the need to game to change. But we focus on the problem. So everyone's holding their breath. Like everyone's like, we're on this journey. Naaman, like, is his leprosy, is he going to get healed from his leprosy? And if you're on that entourage with him, you're excited at the moment when you hear the instructions. He goes to the, the, the house of Elisha and the servant comes and says, Elisha told me to tell you to go dip in the Jordan River. If you're one of Naaman's servants, what are you thinking and doing right now? Here's here's Naaman. He went to Elisha for help. That's step one, right? Now you're one of his servants and you hear the instructions. Go dip in the Jordan River seven times. What are you doing? You are like high stepping. Let's go. Like this is so easy. Let's, let's do this. But we find it, that Naaman's response was far different. If you know the story, Naaman became angry. He was outraged. Because what Naaman expected to happen was he's going to Elisha for help, step one. And then he said, you're supposed to come out and wave your hand over my leprosy and call out to God. He was a two-step human. He needed to become a three-step human. Could you imagine if you were one of his servants and you hear the instructions, go dip in the Jordan River, and you're like, let's go. And then in the background, you hear Elisha or Naaman being all mad. You're like, Look, wait. What? I mean, you're just like dumbfounded. You're like, you're like, Naaman, you've had this problem for maybe your whole life. We all hate it with you. The prophet gave you a simple instruction of what to do to be healed. Why aren't you excited about taking this step? Probably because Naaman had a bigger problem. You see, the reason we need to take these awkward steps is because there's always a greater deliverance that needs to happen that we don't get. We look at someone and we think, they need to stop drinking. But what if that person that has a drinking problem is a man who from a little, little, the age of four years old, felt like he was supposed to do something in this world to make a difference? And when he was five years old, thought he was supposed to make a difference in the world. Six years old, thought his life was supposed to make a difference. Seven years old, all the way through, he thought his life was supposed to be used of God in some way to make a difference. And now he's 35 or 40 years old, maybe he's 25 years old, and he thinks, you know what, I think I've blown it, and I think my life will never make a difference. Is that a reason to have a drinking problem? And we say to that person, you just need to stop drinking. You You know what we need to do with people like that? We need to take them to their closet. And we need to be the voice of God in their life. And we need to grab their cape and put it around their neck. We'll take care of the drinking while you're wearing your cape. Come on, somebody. But when you, think, when you speak to a man, think about a man. And I think, to me, my dream of life, my dream every day that I want to live out is to be just like the five-year-old boy that gets out of the bathtub, 
bored from doing his weekly chore of bathing himself. And he has the he's drying himself partially off, and then he, he looks at that towel. And he has this moment of calling. And he ties it around his neck as a cape. And he looks in the mirror. And he's just like you or me. There's nothing in his body that's impressive. But he's so caught up in this thing that he's forgotten about this thing. And he looks in the mirror and he's like, there's like this, 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 this thing in him that no one taught him that like, I'm supposed to be a man that like does something with my life. And he doesn't know what it is, but he just knows that somehow for some reason my life is supposed to account for something. That somehow in some way my life is supposed to stop some kind of bad thing from happening. Somehow in some way my life is supposed to cause something good to begin to happen. He doesn't know how. And if life strips the cape away from the man, will he drink? Probably. Will he turn to pornography? Probably. Probably. And then the focus of life becomes, oh, we need to change that problem. What's the problem? The man lost his cape is the problem. When a man gets his cape back on, you have a power. You see, when you have a problem, it changes how you think about yourself. It changes how you think about God. You see, Naaman, his response to the instructions tells us possibly a number of things about how he thinks. If you're one of Naaman's servants, you're probably thinking, I thought leprosy was his big problem. Clearly it's not. Because he's outraged. Is that, is that outrage caused by leprosy? The outrage is caused by how he has begun to think about himself because of the leprosy. But the leprosy is not the bigger problem. That's why God needs him to dip in the river because God's trying to free the man. Freedom is always 10 times bigger than our problem. When people, when I talk to people about weight loss, because I used to be a man that was going to die because of a fork and what I did with it. And people say, wow, you've, you've, you've lost weight. That's so great. I'm like, you don't even know. You think wearing a smaller shirt is some badge of glory. Can I talk to you about freedom? When I think about the five-year-old boy, who's naked with a towel around his neck. I think of a young man who was dreaming not just of purpose, but of freedom. The man was made, the man was made for freedom. You and I were made for freedom. The dip into the river was for the changing of the man. And that's the step that we as people like to avoid. We want just the step one, step two. I prayed, did God change anything? I prayed about the relationship, did that change anything? I prayed about the relationship with my, with my child, did it change anything? And I'm not against prayer. I just think it should be followed up by action. <laughs> We can't ask to God to do something in the spiritual that he calls for us to do in the natural. So step one is you go to help. Step two is you take the awkward steps into the river and then you get the power of the help. So what's step two look like? What does step two look like? Let me give some examples of step twos. It's apologizing to someone. 
It's easy for a person to get stuck thinking, I just, I feel bad about that relationship. Well, stop being stuck. Go do something. Like, don't feel bad about the relationship that is estranged. Go take the awkward step of saying to someone, you know, I, I, I wish things were different between us. Maybe you're not the person at fault. But the awkward step of using your voice and saying to your, maybe your adult son or daughter, I, I don't think, you don't even know the words to say. When you walk into the, into the river, you go into awkward things. It's cold, it's dark, it's murky. It feels like it's going to mess stuff up. It's uncomfortable. And you say to that person, I don't know where things went wrong. But if I can do anything to make things go right, I want to do it. What else does a, these, this step into the river look like in a man's life? It might be when you just finally reach out for help. How many people live their life walking on the shore of a river with a problem because of the arrogance of our humanity that I'll fix this on my own? We fix nothing on our own. You will never cross a river that you're trying to walk around. Human arrogance is that I can walk around this. Well, you can try, and then you'll die. I'm going to die in the river. I'm going to die in the river. In the river is where there's freedom, there's purpose. Think in your mind right now, what is an awkward step that you need to take into an awkward stream? Maybe it's getting baptized. Baptism is the perfect example of how preposterous it is to walk with God. Like, okay, so Jesus has saved me, and so now I'm going to go to this public place, and I'm going to, like, they're going to give me a change of clothes. And then I'm going to walk into a tank or a river or whatever and just stand there. And some other human is going to take hold of my body and put me under and bring me up. Preposterous. Yet it perfectly represents the things that you and I need to do to walk with God. Be the kind of person that surrenders yourself to walk into something awkward most of the powerful things that God wants to do in your life only requires we do something awkward. But that's the only thing we won't do. I want to sign up for Walking on Water. Walking on Water Academy. That's for me. Looks good on social media. I went to Walking on Water class. I have a certificate. Life's not about walking on water. Life is about having the humility and surrendering oneself to just walk into things that are the unknown, the uncomfortable, and the awkward. Walking in the power of God, most of the time is that we as humans do the uncomfortable and the awkward and the unknown. That what's human instinct? I want to do something powerful. Walking with God is doing the uncomfortable, the unknown, and the awkward. How about tithing? That's preposterous. But tithing is an example of a step two kind of thing. I can say, God, I trust you. He needs us to tithe so we actually learn how to walk that out. It's an awkward thing. It's so awkward. I sweat and worked hard for this. I'm going to give it. 
But those are the kind of movements that cause us to walk in the power of God. Those are just the kind of movements we don't want to do. What is the step two you need to take in your life? I bet every single person in this room has a step two kind of action to take. I've listed a couple of them. You're thinking of some right now. It's something like baptism. It's something like like tithing. It's something like volunteering. That's preposterous. Like, I'm busy. Why would I take part of my time and just go serve somewhere? Why would I help with a kid's ministry? Like, that's just like, isn't that just time lost? Hmm. That or the power of God moves in your life. Because you're stepping into the river of something that's awkward. What might a step two be? I mentioned relationships. Maybe there's a man here that you need to go home to your wife and say, I'm sorry things are kind of awkward. And I don't think we're where we want to be. What if we change it? Maybe it's going home to a son or a daughter that you guys have just gone sideways with each other. And maybe it's saying to them, I don't think, I don't think I've always been the kind of father I wanted to be to you. But I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. Maybe it's going to a relationship with an adult child and things have been broken for a long time. Maybe your voice awkwardly and uncomfortably saying to them, I know it didn't go according to plan, but what if the rest of the story can be different? Walking in the power of God is about doing uncomfortable, awkward things. It's stepping into the unknown. And when you step into those things, God shows up in your life. And I pray for you that you will no longer live on the shore of your life, but you will step into the river you start with your toes and then you get to your ankles. And then you get to your calves and then your knees. Then you get to your thighs. And then you get to the circumcision. But I pray that you live your life in waters deep enough to get baptized in. Because when you get in waters deep enough, you walk in the greater measures of God's grace and mercy. I pray God's richest blessing upon you, and I compel you today to put on your cape and step into the river. God bless you guys.